Welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship, a virtual gathering of believers seeking to better understand the Word of God, with your hosts, Derek and Sharon Gilbert, and Sam T. Doxon. From the beautiful Missouri Ozarks, greetings and welcome to the Gilbert House Fellowship Old Testament study for Sunday, January 7th of 2018. 2018? Uh, Whoa! I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert, and welcome to our humble bunker. We are so glad you could join us this year. It's our first yes. fellowship of the year. We've not been around for a couple of weeks because of the various holidays we were celebrating and the various writing projects we were trying to finish yes, up. Yes, yes. Um, you missed Eric's birthday, which was this past. Hi, Sam. No, you, your birthday is until July. Um, uh, Derek's birthday was this past Friday, so happy birthday, honey. Thank you, love. Uh, his birthday present was, uh, well, frankly, this setup that you yeah. can't see. <laughs> We've got some uh, LED uh, LED lights in here, some photo lights recommended by Justin Fall. And, uh, um, you know, they're not, they're, they're budget, they're not uh, high end, but uh, they seem to be doing the job really well. They do and, the job, and uh, yeah. now you can do your Skype interviews, and you've got a nice little studio set up, so, yeah. and you can maybe even do, do a, a, who knows, you may even do a pontificating show. Well, who knows? I mean, yeah, the, the lighting in here, and the way you've dressed the uh, area behind uh, with the, the bookcase. Well, and, that, uh, was my, that was my little gift to you well, for your birthday. thank you, sweetheart. That was wonderful. Oh, I Wonderful. love you. Um, sp- speaking of interviews, uh, Josh Peck and I will be on The Conspiracy Show with Richard Syrett tonight. Oh, good. Yeah, but it's at 10 p.m., so I'll probably not be in this room since this room adjoins our bedroom. <laughs> so I'll well, go in the other room. Yeah, yeah that's yeah. the bad thing about yeah. having an office that's actually an ensuite with the bedroom. So. Yeah, but anyway, uh, but that's tonight, 10 p.m. Central Time to midnight Central Time, 11 to 1 Eastern and uh, Richard's program is at uh, the conspiracy show dot ca, uh, but it's syndicated on a number of stations around the country as well. Mm-hmm. So speaking of dot ca, we'll we'll be discussing this later today on PID Radio. But yeah. I came across something interesting on Google where it was said that uh, CBC, which is the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation dot mm-hmm. ca, that that domain was satire. <laughs> that is bizarre, <laughs> and this is I got a screen cap of it. One of the responses that. Um, <laughs> that the progressive media, but I repeat myself, has um, <laughs> that's an oxy. No, it, actually, it, yeah, it is. Yeah, it's it, a it's yeah, redundant. Re, yeah, they have uh, gotten very upset that they they launched they they basically created the term fake news in response to the uh, the the PizzaGate thing, um, and uh, Donald Trump turned it around mm-hmm. on CNN and the Washington Post and New York Times and uh, the MSNBC. And so now they want to ban the term fake news. Oh, I know. And because they're upset that fake news to, to them, which is uh, basically uh, just reporting facts like, oh, they're upset that Hillary Clinton's email got released and that cost her the election, which mm-hmm. is somehow, you know, Russian interference. And in, what, what? Letting us know that Hillary was basically, you know. Selling her selling access to the U.S. Department of State is yeah. Well, we won't anyway, go too uh, far into that. We'll be doing that on PID Radio right, later on today. Right. So you want to make sure that you get that. Uh, we do not yet have a speaker app for PID Radio, but we'll create one soon. So mm-hmm. you want to keep an eye out for that, and we'll announce that's that right, also. That's right because we do have, we a, do have one for Gilbert House. That's right. So you can go to the App Store for uh, Android, the Google Play Store actually, and the iOS, uh, the Apple App Store for your iOS device, your uh, iPad, iPhone, iPod Touch. And you can download an app for the Gilbert House Fellowship and then just get all of that delivered right to your smartphone or tablet. Mm-hmm. Or if you just want to do it the old fashioned way, you can go to Spreaker.com and we'll put a link in this uh, fellowship notes and in the PID Radio page mm-hmm. also. That, by the, by the way, that is PIDradio.com. PID stands for Peering into Darkness because we're the ones scouting for you and reporting mm-hmm. back what's going on in the world so that uh, you know what your kids and grandkids are up to. And right, you don't have right. to look yourself. Because but, some of but, the things, yeah, just aren't really appropriate. But anyway, the, the, our kids. speaker page yeah. there, you can see all the all the podcasts. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the main speak, speaker page has links to all of our podcasts. This PID radio course and a view from the bunker. Mm-hmm. Uh, current interview this week with... Um, Gary Bates about the forthcoming film Alien Intrusion, which opens which this coming Thursday night. Which so. you really want to see, and, yeah. and and it's it's showing in a lot of venues. So mm-hmm. uh, more what? than likely, there's one close to you. Mm-hmm. I know there's a couple of close to us, even here in the Ozarks. Yeah, so. and we're out in the middle of nowhere. That's right. Well, we're back into the Book of Jeremiah. Oh, and by the way, uh, just a reminder: since this is the first Sunday of the month, we will uh, celebrate uh, uh, the Lord's Supper. Mm-hmm. Uh, just as a reminder, and. Um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll talk a little more about it when we get toward the end there. But uh, the significance of it is becoming more and more real as I do more research into other rituals of the ancient world. So, yeah. yeah. Father, we thank you for bringing us together again after these, uh, this layoff and, and pray, pray, Father, that uh, you'll guide us as we, uh, we read and, and seek to better understand your word. Help us, Lord, to add nothing to your word, take nothing away from it, but uh, guide us in our understanding, Father, that we would uh, understand better, that we would um, be able to, to know your will for us. Uh, and uh, again, with, to the best of our ability, knowing that we won't understand perfectly until that day when you come. Uh, Father, we pray for um, your guidance as we uh, read your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Okay. Um, Jeremiah. Isaiah, Jeremiah. Why did I say yeah. Isaiah again? Yeah. Uh, Jeremiah. Um, and, yeah, and yeah, hey, we're, we're getting close to getting uh, into Ezekiel. I you know, know. In just a few more weeks, we're going to start getting into Ezekiel, and that's going to be really awesome. Um, yes, Jeremiah, we, we're starting to get into some of the, uh, the, the hardships that he had to endure for speaking what uh, God gave him to speak. Uh, being a prophet in the Old Testament was not a path to uh, popularity and prosperity, shall we say. Uh, Jeremiah 33, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah a second time while he was still shut up in the court of the guard under house arrest, basically, or under, well, confinement. Thus says Yahweh who made the earth, Yahweh who formed it to establish it. Yahweh is his name. Call to me and I will answer you and I will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. For thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, concerning the thing, the houses of this city and the houses of the kings of Judah that were torn down to make a defense against the siege mounds and against the sword. Because remember, Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians were <laughs> basically outside the walls. They are coming in to fight against the Chaldeans and to fill them with the dead bodies, to fill them with the dead bodies of men whom I shall strike down in my anger and my wrath. For I have hidden my face from this city because of all their evil. Behold, I will, behold, I will bring it to health and healing and I will heal them and reveal to them abundance of prosperity and security. I will restore the fortunes of Judah and the fortunes of Israel and rebuild them as they were at first. I will cleanse them from all the guilt of their sin against me, and I will forgive all the guilt of their sin and rebellion against me. And this city shall be to me a name of joy, a praise and a glory before all the nations of the earth who shall bear, who shall hear of all the good that I do for them. They shall fear and tremble, because of all the good and all the prosperity I provide for it. Can I stop you there? Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that we often forget, that Israel was a light to the nations. Mm -hmm. And Israel's job was to show that their God was the only God, the true God, and that by being obedient to him, he would prosper them. And it was, again, a sign to the nations that they were worshiping the wrong creatures. Mm -hmm. Um, They were not worshiping the creator, but creations. Yes. And uh, they, Israel fell, uh, did, just failed to do that. Mm-hmm. Where Sam's are you going, Sam? It. I'm going to go see if he needs to go out. Okay. All right. Carry on. Will do. Uh, and, and this, again, is a reminder that uh, while God is, is prospering, that or prospering, uh, prophesying that um, Judah and Israel will be restored, that uh, clearly there was a time of uh, trouble and testing that they were going to have to go through first. Um and and that's what uh, was about to happen with Nebuchadnezzar, uh, ready to carry off the uh, the ruling elites and all of the uh, the temple service back to Babylon. Uh, so Jeremiah thirty three, uh, beginning at verse ten. Now, thus says Yahweh, in this place of which you say it is a waste without man or beast, in the cities of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem that are desolate, without man or inhabitant or beast. There shall be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom and the voice of the bride, the voices of those who sing as they bring thank offerings to the house of Yahweh. Give thanks to Yahweh of hosts, for Yahweh is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. For I will restore the fortunes of the land as at first, says Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, in this place that is waste, Without man or beast, and in all of its cities, there shall again be be habitations of shepherds resting their flocks. In the cities of the hill country, in the cities of the Shephelah, and in the cities of the Negev, 
in the land of Benjamin, in the places about Jerusalem, and in the cities of Judah, flocks shall again pass under the hands of the one who counts them, says Yahweh. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will fulfill the promise that I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. And the word branch there is capitalized in the ESV translation, and the reason, I think, is uh, that is a messianic prophecy. It is a metaphor. And uh, branch is, um, the word translated branch is also the root word from which the uh, name of the city Nazareth comes. So, uh, not only a messianic prophecy, but um, pointing to his uh, point of origin, his uh, home city. So, again, verse 14. Um, uh, do verse fourteen. Uh, see, yeah, I'm, I'm using a different uh, different uh, app to uh, read, and and so I'm losing my place more easily. I'm not used to uh, the uh, the uh, screen layout here. <clears throat> okay, here we go. Verse fourteen again. Behold, the days are coming, declares Yahweh, when I will fulfill the promise I made to the house of Israel and the house of Judah. In those days, and at that time, I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David, and he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will dwell securely. And this is the name by which it will be called. Yahweh is our righteousness. This is a play on the name of uh, (laughs) King Zedekiah, who is the uh, king of Israel at this time, the one who had been placed on the throne by Nebuchadnezzar as basically a client king or a puppet king, if you will. And Zedekiah decided to uh, rebel in spite of the prophecies of uh, Jeremiah, who was basically telling him, don't, don't do this because you're defying God's will. Look, if you, if you surrender peacefully, you'll live and eventually be restored. But if you fight, you're going to die. And, of course, the uh, pride of the uh, Judean elites would not allow them to uh, surrender. And so they were destroyed and carried off to Babylon. Verse 17, For thus says Yahweh, David shall never lack a man to sit on the throne of the house of Israel, and the Levitical priests shall never lack a man in my presence to offer burnt offerings, to burn grain offerings, and to make sacrifices forever. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. Thus says Yahweh, If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that day and night will not come at their appointed time, then also my covenant with David my servant may be broken so that he shall not have a son to reign on his throne, and my covenant with the Levitical priests, my ministers. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, and the sands of the sea cannot be measured, so I will multiply the offspring of David my servant, and the Levitical priests who minister to me. Now, of course, we get into the book of Hebrews, as we read in our study in Hebrews back in uh, chapters 7 and 8. Um, Yes, God fulfilled the prophecy that uh, there will always be a son of David on the throne. And, of course, that is a messianic prophecy because Jesus was of the uh, tribe of Judah, uh, a descendant of David. But because he is now also our high priest, and this gets into the the, uh, new covenant that uh, Jeremiah talks about, uh, when there is a change in the priesthood, according to the book of Hebrews, there is necessarily a change in the law as well. We no longer need the Levitical priesthood because that was simply a shadow pointing to the substance, which was Messiah, Jesus. Exactly. Right. Well said. By the way, he was a very good boy. It's raining outside. So even though there's a cold rain coming down, he bravely went out there mm. and fertilized the lawn. Good on him. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, he was looking like he was not able to get comfortable. But you can't when you, you know. No, you can't. When nature calls, you have to answer. He's happily ens- <laughs> ensconced underneath the binky. <laughs> All right. Um, 23, I think. Verse 20, uh, yes, verse 23. The word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. Have you not observed that the, these people are saying Yahweh has rejected the two clans that he chose? Um, by Again, now, the would... nations are saying that. I mean, you know, the the clan of uh, uh, David, Benja, uh, um, Judah, mm-hmm. and Levi. That he chose him to be priests and kings. Mm-hmm. Uh, Israel's gone. I'm sure the nations are just laughing. Yeah, and I, well, I'd say two clans here. He's probably talking about Judah and, and Israel, the northern, the northern kingdom, oh, Judah, well, Judah and Israel. Oh, that could be. Yeah, the two kingdoms. Or could, I, I assumed it was going back to what we just saw about Levitical priests and David, my servant, but uh, maybe not. 
Mm. But anyway, regardless of what two clans he's discussing, the fact is that the nations that Israel was supposed to be a beacon for right. were laughing, and it was it was the opposite, which right. meant that the spirits were laughing. Exactly, yes, uh, because they're the ones behind the 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 activity of us humans on on Earth. Uh, yeah, verse twenty four again. Have you not observed that these people are saying Yahweh has rejected the two clans that he chose? Thus they have despised my people, so that they are no longer a nation in their sight. Thus says Yahweh, If I have not established my covenant with day and night, and the fixed order of heaven and earth, then I will reject the offspring of Jacob and David my servant, and will not choose one of his offspring to rule over the offspring of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. In other words, if you can stop the sun in its tracks, then I will break my covenant with Mm-hmm. Yeah. The only time that happened is when I did it, says Yahweh. Exactly. Yeah, the long day there in the Valley of Ajalon. Uh, For I will restore the fortunes, I will restore their fortunes, and will have mercy on them. Chapter 34. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh, that when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all his army, and all the kingdoms of the earth, all the kingdoms of the earth under mm-hmm. his dominion. So uh, at the time, Babylon was huge. Yeah, Babylon had um, risen up under uh, Nabopolassar, who was Nebuchadnezzar's um, grandfather. Grandfather, yeah, and uh, taken uh, basically they took down the Assyrian Empire, which controlled most of the uh, Mesopotamia and the Fertile Crescent uh, as far as the Mediterranean, all of what is now Syria, Jordan, Israel, you know, Iraq. That was all Assyria. But then the Babylonians rose up in rebellion, along with the Medes and the Persians, took down the Assyrians. And, uh, yeah, Babylon basically took over all of that region. Nebuchadnezzar's uh, name refers to Nabu. Mm -hmm. God of wisdom. Yes. Yeah. The son of, um, son of the trickster God or the the clever God Enki or Ea, Mm -hmm. who was the God of the abyss. Um, again, verse one, then word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon and all his army and all the kingdoms of the earth under his dominion and all the peoples were fighting against Jerusalem and all its cities. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel. Go and, and and that's important. The God of Israel, that's an important definer, modifier, because mm-hmm. he's saying, I'm still God of Israel, and there is still an Israel. Yeah. Yeah, and it refers back to um, the verses in Deuteronomy 4, uh, verses 19 and 20, where he talks about... Um, the inheritance of the other nations being the the host of heaven. Yes. You know, he assigned them as the inheritance of the, the nations, but uh, Israel was his. Mm-hmm. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, go and speak to Zedekiah, king of Judah, and say to him, thus says Yahweh, behold, I am giving this city into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he shall burn it with fire. You're not going to be popular if you go into the king and you say, no. you know, the, the the defenses you're mounting up, mm-hmm. useless. Yeah. You may as well just put the houses back together because it's not going to help. You shall not escape, verse 3, you shall not escape from his hand, but shall surely be captured and delivered into his hand. You shall see the king of Babylon eye to eye and speak with him face to to face, and you shall go to Babylon. Yet hear the word of Yahweh, O Zedekiah, king of Judah. Thus says Yahweh concerning you, you shall not die by the sword, you shall die in peace. And as spices were burned for your fathers, the former kings who were before you, so people shall burn spices for you, and lament for you, saying, Alas, Lord, for I have spoken the word, declares Yahweh. Hmm. That had to have been a comfort in the midst of some really bad news. Mm -hmm. Then Jeremiah the prophet spoke all these words to Zedekiah, king of Judah and Jerusalem, when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, Lachish and Ezekiah, Ezekiah, and for these were the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. Hmm. The others were all gone. Yeah. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh after King Zedekiah had made a covenant with all the people in Jerusalem to make a proclamation of liberty to them, that everyone should set free his Hebrew slaves, male and female, though so that no one should enslave a Jew, his brother. Hmm. And they obeyed 
all the officials and all the people who had entered into the covenant that everyone would set free his slave, male or female, so that they would not be enslaved again. They obeyed and set them free. So this this could be one of two things. This either was um, just a need for more soldiers, and so we need to free the slaves so that they'll fight for us, or it was... Oh, yeah. Doesn't the law say we're supposed to free our slaves every seven years? Yeah, and they hadn't been doing it. Hadn't been doing it. So it was either uh, just a a, a practical thing. Hey, let's be pragmatic here and, and get as many bodies as we can wielding spears. Or uh, let's let's see if we if we finally do this thing that we were supposed to be doing. Maybe God will stop being, Yahweh will stop being angry with us. And here's an important word beginning verse 11. Mm-hmm. But... Afterward, (laughs) they turned around and took back the male and female slaves they had set free and brought them into subjection as slaves. Ah, yes. In other words, we released them. Okay, Jubilee year. Okay, now you're ours again. Yeah, as as we learn from history, um, because at this time in Judah's, the kingdom of Judah's history, it was essentially a client kingdom of uh, Egypt. It was in Egypt's sphere of influence, and so it called on the Egyptians uh, to to come and help them. And so when Egypt brought its army out, that lifted the siege of Jerusalem temporarily. So it's like, okay, the Egyptians are here, slaves. <laughs> Go back to your masters. Yeah. yeah. Um, verse 12, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I myself made a covenant with your fathers when I brought them out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, saying, At the end of seven years, each of you must free the fellow Hebrew, the fellow Hebrew who has been sold to you and served you for six years. Mm -hmm. You must set him free from your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty, each to his neighbor, and you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took back his male and female slaves, slaves whom you had set free by Sam whom you had set free according to their their desire, and you brought them into subjection to be your slaves. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty, everyone to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim to you liberty to the sword, to pestilence, and to famine, Ah. declares Yahweh. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. What you doing there, honey? Changing inputs because this one apparently is talking quite a bit. That that sound that I was hearing? No, that was that was nothing. Okay, there we go. Hello. Yeah, the uh, no, the uh, um that I, I think that first uh, slider on the the mixer is 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 toast. Well, it's it's acting strange. It's acting inconsistently because I I said a couple of things there that just didn't even really pick up on the microphone. So, oh, I see. Yeah. Well, that's what happens. It, eventually, these mixers die. Mm-hmm. Electronics only work for so long. Right. Mm-hmm. Well, we get a lot of use out of this. But anyway, I know. yeah. So anyway, just switch the uh, the in- input. Okay. So anyway, last line. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. You know, I'm sorry, but you cannot just say, loophole in the law, he says to to free the slaves, fine. But he didn't say we couldn't break, take them back. Mm-hmm. That's sort of, it's it's implied within the law that when they're free, they're, they're free. free. Yeah, <laughs> free indeed. Yeah. But no, not, not quite. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two. And passed between its parts. Mm-hmm. Remember that uh, ceremony that Abraham performed. When yeah, he cut all of those those uh, 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 animals into two halves, and God passed between them. Mm-hmm. That was the covenant. That was, and that was a practice that lasted a long time in that part of the world. I mean, exactly. Abraham and God did that in Genesis 15, but uh, you know, again, that was uh, that was around 1900 BC or thereabouts, somewhere in that. Uh, but you time. don't want to be the animal that's cut in two, and that's what he's saying here. Exactly, but I, I'm just pointing out that that's a long, long history. Oh, There's yeah. a long history of that because, but again, we're talking about what, what's going on here in Jeremiah 34 was in 586 BC, so we're talking about something that was a custom 
that have been practiced for almost 1,500 years Mm -hmm. in that part of the world. I mean, here in America, we don't even have a 1,500-year history. We think, you know, a house that's 50 years old is really old. Yeah. (laughs) So, you know, again, this is a long custom in that part of the world. When you make a covenant, you sacrifice an animal and cut it in half. And uh, that was, yeah, I I think it's interesting. Of course, I'm a history nerd. I but, love you. But uh, I love your history nerdiness. But yeah, I just think this is interesting that this was a, a ritual that was performed for so long in that part of the world. Yeah. yeah. Um, I will make them like the calf that they cut into and passed between its parts. The officials of Judah, the officials of Jerusalem, the eunuchs, the priests, and all the people of the land who passed between the parts of the calf. And I will give them into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, their dead bodies Mm -hmm. shall be food for the birds and the air and the beasts of the earth. He's providing a ritual meal. Yeah, yeah. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and we'll talk more about that in a minute. Mm -hmm. And Zedekiah, king of Judah and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. Behold, I will command, declares Yahweh, and will I will command. He's he's leader of hosts. Mm-hmm. He's an army general. Behold, I will command, declares Yahweh, and will bring them back to this city, and they will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. So again, the king of Babylon is withdrawn, but uh, as we'll see in Jeremiah 37, it's because the Egyptians had come and... Um, Nebuchadnezzar had to withdraw in order to array his forces against the king of Egypt. And they're all going, hey, hey, let's take the slaves back. Everything's back to party again. Everything's fine. Yeah. Well, he's saying, yeah. And and it was almost like, test, I'm going to see, I put you under pressure, Mm -hmm. see how you react. Oh, okay, you have obeyed me. Temporarily, yeah. Yeah. And we'll see. But they really look to Egypt again. Yeah, which is something that they had a habit of doing, a bad habit of doing. Even Hezekiah in his day was one of the good kings. Yeah. Um, Now, am I right in saying that at the end of this ceremony where the animals are cut in half, that they are roasted and everybody eats? I would have to look at that. I don't know that. But if that's true, and and it it sort of tickles in my brain. I'm laughing. Um, If that's true, then again, providing a ritual meal and, and... the idea that this meal is not consumed by the humans, mm-hmm. it's consumed by the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. Think spirits. Yeah. This, this comes from the, the, uh, the sort of the Amorite, uh, I guess the word they use is, is koina uh, or milieu. That would be a good <laughs> word. Amorite <laughs> milieu of the, um, the ancient Near East. They, they were so much more influential than we've ever been taught. Um, and it's of course the the Amorites when they used to uh, uh, what do they call it cut a covenant mm-hmm. they, they they would do it with donkeys for some reason sacrificing donkeys was an Amorite thing but it was a, a practice that uh, occurred throughout that part of the world for a long long time um, in, in fact there was uh, they they know that in addition to the reference here in the Bible outside the Bible they they found um, in what is now Syria. Uh, references to this type of um, ritual whenever the, a treaty or a, a, a deal was made where um, animals were cut in half and uh, the, the deal would say something like, or the, the covenant or treaty would say something like, just as this animal, calf, donkey, whatever, has been cut in two, so may these, you know, the parties involved be cut in two if, if we break the, the, the treaty. Mm-hmm. Um, but as Sharon pointed out, well, we're hearing rain. We haven't heard that here in this part of the country yeah, for a no, long what time. What is that wow. sound? It's scary. Um, yeah. We, we had a lot of it back in the spring and then like from July on, like practically nothing. There was there were rituals, ritual meals that were prepared for the dead on a regular basis. Um, in particular, the royal dead of the the Amorites. They, they had a twice monthly feast called the Kispum that was uh, prepared and set out for the uh uh, the, the dead royal ancestors of the the, uh, the Amorites and um, what the Rephaim texts from the ancient Amorite city-state kingdom of Ugarit show us that, uh, and also ancient uh, Babylon. There's a genealogy of uh, Hammurabi the Great with a similar, very similar ritual. Shows that they believed that their ancestors came from a tribe called the Ditanu, which is the root word from which the Greeks got the name of their old gods, the Titans. So. 
Anyway, uh, the, the point is there was a ritual performed for the spirits of the dead that they believed were uh, the Rephaim or the warriors of Baal. Baal. And a, a lot of these rituals have to be viewed in that context. And w- why are they preparing this meal and, and for whom, for what purpose? Uh, in fact, when we, um, you, know, you know, God, if the Lord tarries and we get around to doing the Old Testament study of Isaiah again, uh, there are some verses in there that we'll look at more closely because they, it talks about um, the eating of uh, swine's flesh, eating pork, mm-hmm. which, of course, was prohibited in the uh, the law. But it appears that uh, pork was used, pig was used as a sacrificial animal, especially in these ritual meals prepared for the dead. So that may have had something to do with the prohibition against eating pork in the law, just as uh, in the law, when animals were sacrificed in the temple, there were certain parts of the animal that had to be burned. And if you look in the book of Leviticus, you'll see like two or three times, it, uh, Moses was told to command the Israelites specifically, burn the livers, burn the livers. Why? Because there was a practice in the ancient Near East called heruspicy. I'm probably pronouncing it cor- incorrectly, H-A-R-U-S-P-I-C-Y which is the practice of divining the future by the shape of an animal's liver. That was a thing back then. It was a widespread thing. In fact, the sun god Shamash and the storm god Hadad, or Baal, Mm -hmm. were the gods of heruspicy and, uh, what's the other one, ecstispicy, which is uh, using entrails to tell the future. Uh They were the gods of divining the future by the innards of animals. And so God said, you know, hey, when you're sacrificing this bull on the altar, make sure you burn this, 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 and the livers. Mm -hmm. That's why. Mm -hmm. Well, let me go back to something that does connect uh, also to the idea that the fowls of the air Mm -hmm. and the beasts. Um, Deuteronomy 28, 26, referring to, this is the chapter that gets into the blessings and the curses. If you obey me, then all these blessings will be yours. But if you don't... um, in verse 26, it says, And thy carcass shall be meat unto mm-hmm. all fowls of the air and unto the beasts of the earth, and no man shall fray them away. Hmm. It's a, it's a bad section. Yeah. And, what, you know, the reason that uh, I'm, I'm one of the reasons, one of the many I'm looking forward to Ezekiel, because Ezekiel is rich with stuff, is that in Ezekiel 39, which is part of the Gog-Magog conflict. Yes. Um, when the hordes of Magog come against the mountains of Israel, and specifically the holy mountain of God, the Mount of Assembly, um, they will be defeated. And uh, God says um, that this will take place in the Valley of the Travelers, east of the sea, which is uh, the Jordan River Valley, east of the sea, which was the um, ancient location of uh, the tribes of Rephaim in the days of Abraham. But... um, After their defeat, God tells Ezekiel, speak to the birds of every sort and all the beasts of the field. Assemble and come, gather from all around to the sacrificial feast that I am preparing for you, a great sacrificial feast on the mountains of Israel, etc., etc. This is echoed in Revelation 19. It's a flip of what we see here, because it's Israel who's, who's you know, essentially we're the dinner. Being sacrificed. Our dead bodies are the dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, This is going to be the opposite. The enemies of Israel, their dead bodies will be the dinner. Mm -hmm. Um, It's really important that you understand that this is in this section where Israel, their dead bodies will serve as as food for the birds and the beasts. That this is the Lord essentially laying a trap. Mm-hmm. for his enemies, mm-hmm. the spiritual enemies, because at this point, when Israel appears to fail and fall, that they're thinking mm-hmm. Yahweh has failed and fallen. You know, and in a, in a like manner, when uh, Jesus was uh, killed on the cross, yes, just as Paul wrote to the church at Corinth, if the uh, uh, the rulers of this age, the archons, had understood this, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. And this is the other thing I think is fine, and I'm, I'm digging into this to find this, because this is going to go into the, the forthcoming book uh, out probably in the summer, um, that there seems to be a three-day period, that the period of three days between the time of the sacrifice and the time of the uh, consumption of the sacrifice, mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, or the culmination thereof, uh, 
has some significance that when these feasts for the dead were prepared, that um, the, the animal would be sacrificed, usually, you know, pig and unclean, the unclean animal. And then it was consumed on the third day. And so, you know, what, what is the connection to Jesus having his sacrificial meal the night before he was betrayed or on the night that he was betrayed mm-hmm. rather. And then three days later, and we're, we're jumping ahead to this, but uh, this is all tying together with this you know, being the first Sunday of the month. Um, the, on the third day, he returned. He came back. He was down there according to uh, New Testament scripture. And I forget where it is in, in uh, is it first Peter where he's talked about, where it talks about him going down to preaching to the, yes, I uh, think so. preaching to the, the prisoners, Tartar, yeah. Preaching to the prisoners. Um, they must have thought, yeah, we, we got him. Just like, you know, here in Jeremiah, when the uh, the Babylonians, the Chaldeans, had come against them and were about ready to make the rebellious sons of, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob a sacrificial meal for the birds and the beasts, uh, they must have thought the same thing when Jesus was killed. Oh, yes, very much like when uh, Lucifer arrives, the king of Tyre, we see in mm-hmm. Isaiah when he comes, Isaiah 14, is that it? Mm-hmm. Oh, you, you're just like us. You come down to us. Yeah, they must have we- at the same time said to the Son of God, oh, apparently you're just like us. You're just like us, yeah. Yeah, but I would also say, this is interesting about the third day uh, feasting idea, mm-hmm. that uh, uh, if a day with the Lord is as a thousand years, it's been 2,000 plus years since Christ uh, ar- arose, mm-hmm. since he was uh, sacrificed and then arose a few, uh, three days on the third day, um, he's mm-hmm. coming back, I believe, mm-hmm. before that third day is complete. So during the third day, he will be back, and one of the first things we do is have a meal. Yeah. The uh, marriage supper of the Lamb? Yes. Oh, yeah. I hadn't even thought about that. Oh, Well, sweet. you think about that. Yeah. Okay, verse 21, yeah. I'll finish this up. And Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his officials, I will give into the hand of their enemies and into the hand of those who seek their lives, into the hand of the army of the king of Babylon, which has withdrawn from you. Behold, I will command, declares Yahweh, and will bring them back to this city, and they will fight against it and take it and burn it with fire. I will make the cities of Judah a desolation without inhabitant. So even though he said to Zedekiah, you will die and be, uh, you know, as spices will be burned for you, you'll die in peace and and this and that, you will die in Babylon. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm still going to take you guys out. And uh, Zedekiah, okay, sounds good to me. We're going to release all the slaves. Oh, um, now that we've done that and things seem to be good, Babylon's uh, withdrawn. Okay, Um, everything back to normal. Party. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Human beings. All is well. Yeah. Uh, chapter 35 of Jeremiah. Now, this goes back to, uh, this is not sequential. In fact, they uh, headline it right here in the very first verse. The word that came to Jeremiah from Yahweh in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah. Uh, Jeho- Jehoiakim was the uh, the king who preceded Zedekiah. So uh, this was before 597 BC. So we're going back in time about 10 years or so. Don't even need a DeLorean to do it. No. This is to contrast the faithlessness of Judah with the faithfulness of a group of people called the Rechabites. Uh, and Rechab, uh, apparently descendants of um, the father Rahab? of Jon- Jonadab. Oh, it means jo- writer. Jonadab. The father of Jonadab, who's mentioned in Jeremiah 35. Yeah, in the time of King <clears throat> Jehu. Or yeah, Yehu. yeah. Um. The word came to Jeremiah from Yahweh in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. Go to the house of the Rechabites and speak with them and bring them to the house of Yahweh into one of the chambers, then offer them wine to drink. So I took Jeazaniah, the son of Jeremiah, son of Habazaniah, and his brothers and all his sons and the whole house of the Rechabites. I brought them to the house of Yahweh into the chamber of the sons of Hanan, the son of Igdaliah, the man of God, who was near the chamber of the officials above the chamber of Maaseah, the son of Shalom, keeper of the threshold. Then I set before the Rechabites pitchers full of wine and cups, and I said to them, Drink wine. But they said, But they answered, We will drink no wine. For Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, commanded us, You shall not drink wine, neither you nor your sons forever. You shall not build a house. You shall not sow seed. You shall not plant or have a vineyard, but you shall live in tents all your days, that you may live many days in the land where you sojourn. 
We have obeyed the voice of Jonadab, the son of Rechab, our father, in all that he commanded us, to drink no wine all our days, ourselves, our wives, our sons, and our daughters, and not to build houses to dwell in. We have no vineyard or field or seed, but we have lived in tents and have obeyed and done all that Jonadab, our father, commanded us. But when Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came up against the land, we said, Come and let us go to Jerusalem for fear of the army of the Chaldeans and the army of the Syrians. So we are living in Jerusalem. So the Rechabites normally... um, Nomads. So this flashback shows us why they're in Jerusalem. Right, because normally they wouldn't be living inside the city. They'd be out living in their tents with their their flocks. Right. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah. Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Go and say to the people of Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem, Will you not receive instruction and listen to my words, declares Yahweh? The command that Jonadab, the son of Rechab, gave to his sons to drink no wine has been kept. And they drink none to this day, for they have obeyed their father's command. I have spoken to you persistently, but you have not listened to me. I have sent to you all my servants, the prophets, sending them persistently, saying, Turn now, every one of you, from his evil way, and amend your deeds, and do not go after other gods to serve them. And then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to you and your fathers. But you did not incline your ear or listen to me. The sons of Jonadab, the sons, the son of Rechab, have kept the command their father gave them, but this people has not obeyed me. Therefore, thus says Yahweh, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I am bringing upon Judah and all the inhabitants of Jerusalem all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, because I have spoken to them, and they have not listened. I have called to them, and they have not answered. But to the house of the Rechabites, Jeremiah said, Thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Because you have obeyed the command of Jonadab your father and kept all his precepts and done all that he commanded you, therefore, thus says Yahweh of hosts, the God of Israel, Jonadab, the son of Rechab, will never lack a man to stand before me. Wow, that's neat. Yeah, again, a contrast between the sons of Rechab and the the rest of Judah. Chapter 36. In the fourth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came to Jeremiah from Yahweh. Take a scroll... And write on it all the words that I have spoken to you against Israel and Judah and all the nations from the day I spoke to you from the days of Josiah until today. It may be that the house of Judah will hear all the disaster that I intend to do to them so that every one may turn from his evil way and that I may forgive their iniquity and their sin. Then Jeremiah called Baruch the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll at the dictation of Jeremiah all the words of Yahweh that he had spoken to them, to him. And Jeremiah ordered Baruch, saying, I am banned from going to the house of Yahweh, so you are to go, and on a day of fasting in the hearing of all the people in Yahweh's house, you shall read the words of Yahweh from the scroll that you have written at my dictation." You shall read them also in the hearing of all the men of Judah who come from out of their cities. It may be that their plea for mercy will come before Yahweh and that everyone will turn from his evil way. For great is the anger and wrath that Yahweh has pronounced against this people. And Baruch the son of Neriah did all that Jeremiah the prophet ordered him about reading from the scroll the words of Yahweh in Yahweh's house. In the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, all the people in Israel and all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem proclaimed a fast before Yahweh. Then in the hearing of all the people, Baruch read the words of Jeremiah from the scroll in the house of Yahweh in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the secretary, which was in the upper court at the entry of the new gate of Yahweh's house. When Micaiah, the son of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, heard all the words of Yahweh from the scroll, he went down to the king's house, into the secretary's chamber, and all the officials were sitting there. They weren't in the temple? (laughs) Elshama, the secretary, Deliah, the son of Shemaiah, Elnathan, the son of Achbor, Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, Zedekiah, the son of Hananiah, and all the officials. And Micaiah told them all the words that he had heard when Barak read the scroll in the hearing of the people. Then all the officials sent Jehudi, or Yehudi, the son of Nathaniah, son of Shelemiah, son of Cushi, to, son of Cushi, to say to Barak, Baruch, sorry, mm-hmm. 
Take in your hand the scroll that you read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch, the son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And they said to him, Sit down and read it. So they could have heard it if they'd gone to temple. So Baruch read it to them. And when they heard all the words, they turned one to another in fear. And they said to Baruch, We must report all these words to the king, as if the king hadn't heard them already. Sure, yeah. Then they asked Baruch, Tell us, please, how did you write all these words? Was it at his dictation? Baruch answered them, He dictated all these words to me while I wrote them with ink on the scroll. You cannot erase them. It is ink. (laughs) Then the official said to Baruch, Go and hide you and Jeremiah and let no one know where you are. So they went into the court to the king, having put the scroll in the chamber of Elishama, the secretary, and they repeat, reported all the words to the king. Interesting that they uh, they knew this was important stuff they needed to take to king, the king, but they also knew the king was not going to be happy to hear it. And they put the scroll in the chamber of the secretary instead of taking it with them. Mm. And the king said to Jehudi the, to get the sent Jehudi to get the scroll, and he took it from the chamber of Elishama, the secretary, and Jehudi read it to the king and all the officials who stood beside the king. It was the ninth month. That would be December, actually. And the king was sitting in the winter house, and there was a fire burning in the fire pot before him. And Yehudi read three or four columns. The king would cut them off with a knife and throw them into the fire in the fire pot until the entire scroll was consumed in the fire that was in the fire pot. Yet neither the king nor any of his servants who heard all these words was afraid, hmm. nor did they tear their garments. Even when Elnathan and Deliah and Gemariah urged the king not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them. And the king commanded Jeramel, the king's son, and Sariah, the son of Azrael, and Shalemiah, the son of Abdael, to seize Baruch, the secretary, and Jeremiah, the prophet, But Yahweh hid them. Now after the king had burned the scroll with the words that Baruch wrote at Jeremiah's dictation, the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah, Take another scroll and Hmm. write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll. Like you can destroy the word of Yahweh. Yeah, that's um, hubris. Take another scroll and write on it all the former words that were in the first scroll, which Jehoiakim, the the king of Judah, has burned. And concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, you shall say, Thus says Yahweh, You have burned this scroll, saying, Why have you written in it that the king of Babylon will certainly come and destroy this land and will cut off from it man and beast? Therefore, thus says Yahweh concerning Jehoiakim, king of Judah, He shall have none to sit on the throne of David, and his body shall be cast out to the heat by day and the frost by night. And I will punish him and his offspring and his servants for their iniquity. I will bring upon them and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem Jerusalem, and upon the people of Judah all the disaster that I have pronounced against them, but they would not hear. Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Barak the scribe, the son of Neriah, take this, Mm -hmm. who wrote on it the dictation of Jeremiah, all the words of the scroll that Jehoiakim, king of Judah, had burned in the fire, and many similar words were added to them. Hmm. Jeremiah chapter 37. Now we're back into the reign of Zedekiah, the son of Jehoiakim, or brother of Jehoiakim, actually. Uh, Zedekiah, the son of Josiah whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. So another Jehoiakim was deposed by Nebuchadnezzar. And that's why we have this, yeah, I'm cutting off your right, line. Right, exactly. Uh, he deposed um, Jehoiakim in 597 B.C. and made Je- uh, Zedekiah king. Zedekiah reigned until 586 when he rebelled, and that was um, what we had seen back in uh, chapter uh, 34. When mm-hmm. we, we departed uh, the, the timeline. Now we're back in the timeline of Zedekiah. Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, whom Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Jehoiakim. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land listened to the words of Yahweh that he spoke through Jeremiah the prophet. 
King Zedekiah sent Jehuchal the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah the priest, the son of Maaseiah, to Jeremiah the prophet, saying, Please pray for us to Yahweh our God. Now Jeremiah was still going in and out among the people, for he had not yet been put in prison. The army of Pharaoh had come out of Egypt, and when the Chaldeans who were besieging Jerusalem heard news about them, they withdrew from Jerusalem. Then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet. It's like a recap at the beginning of right. when last. Previously in Jeremiah. <laughs> then the word of Yahweh came to Jeremiah the prophet. Thus says Yahweh, God of Israel, Thus shall you say to the king of Judah who sent you to inquire of me, Behold, Pharaoh's army that came to help you is about to return to Egypt to its own land, and the Chaldeans shall come back and fight against this city. They shall capture it and burn it with fire. Thus says Yahweh, Do not deceive yourselves, saying the Chaldeans will surely go away from us, for they will not go away. For even if you should defeat the whole army of Chaldeans who are fighting against you, and there remained of them only wounded men, every man in his tent, they would rise up and burn this city with fire. Now when the Chaldean army had withdrawn from Jerusalem at the approach of Pharaoh's army, Jeremiah set out from Jerusalem to go to the land of Benjamin to receive his portion there amongst his people among the people. When he was at the Benjamin gate, a sentry there named Urijah, the son of Shelemiah, son of Hananiah, seized Jeremiah the prophet, saying, You are deserting the Chaldean. You are deserting to the Chaldeans. And Jeremiah said, It is a lie. I am not deserting to the Chaldeans. But Urijah would not listen to him and seized Jeremiah and brought him to the officials. And the officials were enraged at Jeremiah, and they beat him and imprisoned him in the house of Jonathan the secretary, for it had been made a prison. When Jeremiah had come to the dungeon cells and remained there many days, King Zedekiah sent for him and received him. The king questioned him secretly in his house and said, Is there any word from Yahweh? Yeah, I'm sorry we threw you in jail, but uh, Yahweh have something. Got anything good to tell me? Jeremiah said, There is. Then he said, You shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. Jeremiah, not exactly what Zedekiah was hoping for. Jeremiah also said to King Zedekiah, What wrong have I done to you or your servants or this people that you have put me in prison? Where are your prophets who prophesied to you saying, The king of Babylon will not come against you and against this land? They're not in prison. No. Now here, please, O my lord the king, let my humble plea come before you and do not send me back to the house of Jonathan the secretary, lest I die there. So Zedekiah gave orders, and they committed Jeremiah to the court of the guard. And a loaf of bread was given him daily from the baker's street until all the bread of the city was gone. So Jeremiah remained in the court of the guard. Hmm. So next week when we pick up and return to the story of Jeremiah, well, things get worse and he gets thrown back into prison again. Well, that's his life. Yeah. Actually worse, he gets thrown into a cistern. Well, that's the thing. I mean, I know that there are some folks who, and we've talked about this before, how there are many of us who long to see the Lord, who long to hear his voice speaking. When, When the Lord does speak audibly to someone, it's for his purposes, Mm -hmm. and it's not always a good thing. No. um, No, there was a young lady that we knew back uh, in the day when, uh, you know, back at our, yeah, when we were, um, the church we got married in back in St. Louis, uh, an intelligent young woman. In fact, uh, one who, um, I say young, she's our age, so (laughs) we were were younger then, too. Um, But she had confessed that she really wanted to hear the voice of God in the same way that the prophets did. And uh, yeah, I, I think that that is um, a calling that is reserved for very few because it is not one that is um, an easy calling. It's not one that most of us can handle. It's certainly not one that I aspire to, that's for sure. Because no. uh, ju- judging by what we see from uh, the life of Jeremiah and as we'll see from the, the life of Ezekiel, boy, that's just a that's a right. tough row to hoe. Exactly. Well, you know, if the Lord called upon you or me to to do that, that's that's His choice, and we well, would do what He asks us to do. But it's not something I'm I'm going to ask for. No, no. Um, and I'm content to serve Him in the way we're serving Him now. Exactly, and, and not to cast any aspersions on any particular ministries. But this, you know, being a prophet is not something you can go to school to learn how to do. No, you know, it is a calling that is thrust upon you. Yeah. So, well, as we do on the first. Sunday of every month, we remember the, the, the Lord's Supper. And as I'm discovering, and this is going to be a big part of the book, or, well, an important part of the book that I'm working on for the summer, um, the significance of the Lord's Supper 
in relation to rituals performed by the pagan nations around ancient Israel, and especially their dependence, their reliance on the gods of the dead. There, there is a, um, a story, and I forget which of the kings of Israel. It was one of the kings of the northern kingdom who had fallen and had uh, gotten had fallen ill. And I forget if it was he had taken a fall and was injured or if he had just gotten sick. But, um, and maybe it wasn't the king of Israel. Anyway, it was one, one, of the, one of the kings, either Judah or Israel. It was somewhere in the Bible. <laughs> I should have looked this up. Um, but he was condemned by a prophet for relying on the healers rather than praying to Yahweh uh, for his healing. Mm-hmm. Well, for some reason, and I've not really seen a good explanation for this anywhere, because it always seems to me that they're trying to shoehorn a meaning into the term. The root word that is translated in the Bible, uh, Rephaim, sometimes translated shades as in ghosts, shades of the dead. Um, scholars believe that that root has a core meaning. Um, I think the term is lemma. Like yeah. uh, what is the, the core meaning of this, the root of this word? It, somehow they, they think it means healer. And I've never seen anything in the Bible or any of the texts from the ancient Amorites or Canaanites that indicates that they had any healing function. So what you're saying is he was relying. He was upon relying on the he was, spirits. He was, he was relying was, on the spirits, right? I, I think that's what the, the the actual deeper meaning of that that verse is that he was doing this type of sacrifice to the shades, to the dead, to the to the to the the rafa, the travelers. But we see this over and over again, even today in third world nations, mm-hmm. that there are those who are seeking healing, and oftentimes it has to do with right. sexual healing. Right. That they're in, they're going to these spirit entities. Mm-hmm. But even in a broader sense, the um, what had been a doctoral dissertation by uh, Reverend Dr. Robert Bennett, who is a um, an educator in the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, he goes around and trains Lutheran pastors all over the world. Uh, his book "I Am Not Afraid" was about the veneration of the dead, ancestor worship on the island of Madagascar. Mm-hmm. So this was not confined to the ancient Near East. It wasn't just the uh, you know the people of Babylon and ancient Syria right. who were doing this. This is all over the world. So did we get here by talking about the ritual meal? The ritual meal. Okay. Right. So uh, anyway, this is a reversal of that. Yes. And that's the point. And that's, uh, I'm going to dig into that for the, for the book because I think that this it's, – it's fascinating history, but it's not just – History, like, uh, you know, trivial pursuit history, there, there's a, a relevance here because God clearly thought it was important enough to turn it around and reverse it in how he chose to be remembered. And and that's one reason that I think that the healing aspect of the Rephaim needs to really be studied because yes. there are many things about Christ's sacrifice for us that heal us. Yes. By his stripes, we are healed. Yes. Yeah. Hmm. Okay, mental note. Anyway, uh, but to get on to the uh, the, the actual remembrance, um, and this is Paul who was writing to the church at Corinth and relating to them what he had been taught by the brothers in Jerusalem. Dad, you're taking too long. Yeah. I'm leaving now. 1 Corinthians 11, beginning at verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, <clears throat> in the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. His tail's wagging him. Mm-hmm. He knows we're near the end. Mm-hmm. Yeah. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Amen. And again, quite a reversal from the ritual meal, Mm -hmm. the sacrificial meal of Ezekiel 39, the sacrificial meal of Revelation 19. Yeah. Um, I can see how this could take up a large portion of that book. Mm -hmm. It's it's amazing. Yeah. Well, lots of studying to do, so we'll get on to that, but this is a joy, and to be able to do this is uh, our our vocation is is truly a privilege. Mm Mm-hmm. So, uh, PID Radio later today. Also, a view from the bunker coming up later tonight. And then tonight, 10 p.m. Central Time, Josh Peck and I talk about the book, The Day the Earth Stands Still. And now, is that an audio only? Audio and video. Oh. Yeah. 
it's a shame you can't be. I could, you know, sleep in the other room. Or no, 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 no. I can go in there and just use the webcam on the laptop. It's not that big a deal. I could, you know, drink a whole bottle of wine. <laughs> 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 Actually, I'm such a lightweight, you know, drinking like two drinks and I'd be out. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, but you'll find that, uh, and I'll, I'll post a note to that. Just check my Twitter feed because uh, I'll post links to that later today uh, as we talk about the book and, and why the UFO phenomenon is really a new religion. So until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. Oh, wait, were you going to pray? Oh, yeah, I guess I should, shouldn't I? Just got went into, went into a closing format mode Aww, in my head. I've that's got, okay. yeah. Um, Father, we thank you for this day. And Lord, we, we thank you for this time that we come together over your word. We thank you for the. Um, the instruction and the encouragement that comes from uh, your word, knowing that um, you have foreseen the end from the beginning and that all of these things work together for our salvation, for those who trust in Christ Jesus as Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling and suffering this week, suffering with um, uh, relationships, emotionally, um, physically, financially, Father. We pray for those especially who are carrying the gospel to the ends of the world, uh, the ends of the earth, uh, in fulfillment of the Great Commission to make disciples of all nations. Lord, we pray for wisdom and discernment. We ask for your blessing, and we pray in the name of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Until next time, I'm Derek Gilbert. I'm Sharon Gilbert. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you for joining us. We post a new Bible study each Sunday morning. Subscribe to the podcast and explore the archives online at gilberthouse.org. 